we got married, we went on a honeymoon in the Philippines. We got married in the Philippines. And uh, we went to an island that she discovered through a college friend. It became one of her best friends in college. And her husband and, and his family is from this island. It's called Komodis, and which translates as sweet potato, sweet potato island. So we did eat some sweet potatoes the first time I went there. Uh, we didn't eat any this last time. But just through going over there for the honeymoon, um, when we rented the place and, and we went and slept our first night and we woke up the next day, there were children that showed up. God, this is going to be harder than I thought it was going to be. There were some kids that showed up at our rental house and Chari had already connected with them on a prior trip before before we went on our honeymoon and so she was just looking at me because she she didn't know, I mean we had been dating for a little while but she didn't know what I was going to think about that this was unplanned and those kids were hungry and she had already fed them the, the trip before that when I wasn't there and she was looking at me <laughs> And I was like, come on, man, are you serious? Of course. And so we fed them breakfast or lunch, dinner, whichever the first meal was. And then every day was breakfast, lunch, dinner. Every day. This is my honeymoon. <laughs> breakfast, lunch, dinner. They started to warm up to us to where in the morning time, they would come jump in the bed with me. My wife was up. She was stirring in the kitchen or something. And I was still trying to sleep. And the kids would come in the room and they would just all jump on the bed and wake me up. And so there was just an instant connection that took place. And I have to be honest, we did not minister the Word of God to them a whole lot that first trip. We were feeding them and we were just showing them a lot of love. And then when we went back the next year, we, we only went for one day to Komodis. So this is something that over the years, the Lord has just slowly started to work into our heart what His plan is for us over there in Komodis. And so what happened is we, I don't know, I, I can't remember, I, I want to say it was kind of my idea that we do some Bible trivia questions. And then she said, well, let's make it a contest and I'll reward them. And, and so we did Bible trivia questions and we preached the gospel through this game on the street. I don't know how many, maybe 20 kids. There was a lot of kids out there. There were adults that started to come because they, they just heard the noise. It was late in the evening. And they were observing. And, and we're preaching the gospel through a Bible trivia game. I, we didn't have much time. you got to understand, we were there for one day, and we were about to have to go. And I, it was a last-ditch effort. And in my mind, in my heart, I'm like, we got to do something. we got to do something. They need the gospel. And so we went through this Bible trivia game. We had a winner. And then we reviewed it. And just drilled the gospel about being born again, about what Jesus did on the cross, about that being the greatest gift that the world has ever been given. And they embraced it. And we prayed with them that day with those, I don't know, 20 some odd kids or so. And when we said amen, the oldest kid in the group, she was 17 years old at the time. Her name is, is Erica. And Erica said, wow. Did you feel that? And she was just crying and crying and tears pouring out. And, and that's that's when it really started to shift in a, in a more significant way in both of our hearts that there's something more God wants to do here with us. And so now we have a house that we're building over there. There's a lot going on. And so... I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read this scripture. It's actually Psalms chapter 2. Thank you, Lord. And I didn't know that Matt had preached this. Pastor preached this when we were in the Philippines. This is in one of his messages. It says, Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. 
The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges. O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. And I'm, I'm reading from the NASB, and I have to be honest. I prefer the King James and the New King James and the ESV on this part. Because mine says, do homage to the Son, that he not become angry and you perish in the way. But the version that I like more says, kiss the Son. Kiss the Son, that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. Be kindled. Be started. Not quenched, not put out. We're talking about be kindled, be started. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. And Lord, we just thank You for Your presence this morning. I thank You for the worship. I thank You, Lord, for our worship team, our singers and musicians. I thank You for Naya Gilbreth. And I lift up the Gilbreth family before Your throne right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And I ask God that You would just send supernatural Holy Ghost blood of the cross Jesus Christ power to that family right now. All the distraction all of the fear that the enemy is trying to invoke on them today. I ask God that you would just bring peace that only the Prince of Peace can give. And I'm asking God that you would give Naya peace in her heart and in her soul right now in the name of Jesus. And I'm asking God that you would take control over the remainder of this service. I ask you to use me and use Chari, and that, Lord, we would not speak not one word that is not of you, and we would not hold back not one word that is what you want us to speak today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for standing. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to do a little different. We have a little bit of a presentation that, that we're going to present to you. So... I already kind of started you off, gave you a little bit of history. And so she's not from Komodi. She's not from that island. She discovered it through her best friend in college. And so it's been, uh, it was nine years ago when we really started to minister the word to the kids in any way. And then ever since, we would go back each year and we would continue to minister to them until 2019 happened. And uh, when 2019 happened and flights were changed, the way you fly, the everything, just jobs, all that mess, we were already proceeding to cancel our flight and then the airline canceled it for us and we got our money back, praise God. But we didn't go uh, in 2019 and so it's been over five years and we just went back and just returned turned here. So it's been uh, over five years and i'm gonna tell you what man we've been praying for five years we've been praying uh sometimes more earnestly and then there's times when you know not so much but we've continued to believe god that we were gonna go back and look when 2019 happened we didn't know any more than anybody else how that was going to end how that was going to continue if it was just going to completely control everything for until Jesus returns, until everything, you know, until we're out of here. So, but we just kept praying, God, look, we don't know what's going to happen with all this. We just know you called us. <laughs> That's all that matters. All that matters is we know you called us to a specific place. And we know we have to go back. And so we connected with seven children. There were seven children. And out of seven children, there's only six left. <laughs> One died. She got pregnant. She got pregnant uh, before we got back and she, they, they found out, they realized that she had a hole in her heart. And so during the pregnancy, she couldn't handle it and she ended up dying. 
and the baby's still alive. Praise God for that. And so this girl, her name is Gentleman, and she had the most beautiful singing voice out of all seven of them. She was the one. I mean, she stood, I, it was just beautiful, and, and I, I miss that girl. I miss that voice. I, I really do. But praise God, her sister, Princess, Princess Hart is her name. Princess Heart is still around, and, she, and we connected with Princess Heart. And we were able to pray with Princess Heart. We were able to lay hands on her because she's still grieving the loss of her sister. It hasn't been uh, very, very long ago that this happened. And so we were able to get all the children to come around, and we all laid hands on Princess, and we prayed over her. And, and the Lord just really, really ministered to her heart and allowed her to just get more of that mourning out and, and that weeping out and, and let God just do what God does. And so it was really beautiful. It was really amazing. So we reconnect, we connected with her. And, and so it was just really interesting the way all this started to happen. So, so we've been very careful how we put this presentation together because of the children and there's a lot of close up stuff. So what's on here obviously is going to be on the camera, but we're going to have some things, some photos up on the monitors at certain times and those are what the names and the faces and it's much closer and so we don't want to put that on the internet if you know what i mean so just for protection for these kids um, there's a lot of other stuff about the philippines and children are, are really a, a huge target of the enemy there so we just want to be careful how we do this and, and try to do it in the most respectful way so what ended up happening is um when we first got there this trip um Shari, uh, she took a, a ride over to the beach where we had first connected with the seven kids, the original seven. And so when she went over to the beach to, to meet with the original seven, um, she didn't find all of them, but I think she found maybe three, two or three of them. And then all these other children just came around. And then, so it's probably best that we give it to Shari now because <coughs> She tells this part of the story better because it, it is her story. Just to talk about at the beach when you went and found the kids and how we just kind of connected with them, how we connected with them this time. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> so the original said that I only have one contact and she's not reliable. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat is hurt. So, and she said that the children will not come because there's no transportation. And so I made a way and contact our neighbors, uh, can we or, 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 like, have some transportation somehow. And I asked my best friend if we can lend, uh, borrow her chimney. And she, she said it's fully booked for the three days. Why you didn't tell me in advance? Like, okay, because I didn't know and we never anticipate that children would not be available. So the next, uh, uh, offer was our neighbor of our tricycle. A tricycle is like a motorcycle with a sidecar and only like six people get, can fit in. So um, <clears throat> so when I approached them, they they already uh, uh, yelled my name and I don't know all of them. I only recognize one with a similar face and I, I call her Glory. I did not realize she's the sister of the original. And the wonder she's like, she like, I'm not Glory, right? But her face is so similar, so I thought that was, I said, Glory! And she said, no, I think they're screaming, Charlie, I have a char, a char. So they, they right away um, look at my face and they right, uh, right away get into the uh, bicycle and they, that they build trust right away. And I said, wait, 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 did you ask permission from your parents? And she said, yeah, their parents is okay. And like, uh, no, did you ask? permission okay so since this is informal i did not announce so why not i take you today at uh, tonight and then i'll once we're done then we're gonna uh, release you back and then tomorrow as permission is gonna be night out for friday and saturday only because sunday because um, we're gonna do this because uh, we're gonna go to school and then I uh, bring your clothes on uh, Fridays and Saturday, and then we can have um, a, a fellowship the whole uh, the week. They said they agreed on that. You can put it back up on the TV. Thank you. Yeah. So, so Glory Bell. Glory Bell was 
one of the original. I believe now she's 17 years old. And this is no exaggeration. When I saw Cindy Marie, Cindy Marie is her younger sister. So when we met Glory Bell, Glory Bell was, I believe, eight years old. That was 10 years ago. Cindy Marie was two years old. Okay, so, and now she's 12 years old. And when we saw her, I, I was the same way. I was like, wait, because I see Glory Bell right here. And then I see Cindy Marie and I'm like, Glory Bell don't look like Glory Bell. Cindy Marie looks like Glory Bell, you know, because that's the Glory Bell I remember. I mean, they, the, the resemblance was so strong. It was really remarkable. So that's kind of how she gathered them up, reconnected with a few of the originals. And then all these new kids just started coming. They were calling her Ati Char, Ati Char. Ati means big sister. It, it's a, it's a, a respectful addressing of, of a female, you know, when you have respect for an adult or someone that's older. So you call them Ati Char, Ati Char. And she didn't even know these kids. Some of them she had never seen before, but they knew who she was. <laughs> and so she's gathering all this together and she's like, no, look, we'll do, a, we'll do a sleepover, but you gotta ask your parents Friday night, Saturday night. It worked out. So then every day they would show up at the house. If it was the weekend, it would be early in the morning because some of them didn't sleep over. And then there would be the weekdays that would just show up in the evening after school when they were done not done doing their homework, whatever, they would show up and, and we would end up feeding them and we, and we started to teach them and started to get into uh, some Bibles teaching and different things like that. So we'll go ahead, Chari, and we can start with that first video. This is just an example of just kind of the setting that we were in. Okay, so that's very short. Yeah, seven seconds. Yeah. Even when we do wrong, he still loves us. Right. He does still love us when we do wrong. I was talking to him about the story of Adam and Eve. That's where we started. So we took the Read and Grow Picture Bible, and uh, we, we took some frames from the story, and we were screen casting it on a TV, on a smart TV over there. So right here is the TV, and they're looking at the pictures, and we're talking about Adam and Eve, and and if you know that read and grow picture Bible and you remember the story of Adam and Eve, you got the serpent on almost every picture, almost every page and every frame of the picture, the serpent's somewhere in the bushes, just his head, or you can see the whole serpent. Or, and, and so I just, to try to help keep their attention, I was like, where's the serpent? Where's the serpent at? You see the serpent in that picture right there? And then they, this is how they point. They go, <laughs> don't be blowing me kisses. Come point at the dog on the serpent. Where's the serpent in this picture, Frank? But so what ended up happening was we explained to them how sin entered into the world. We explained to them how it all began. Why are we struggling? Why are we so hateful to one another sometimes? And so we just broke it down and went into this. And so we're doing informal teaching like that at certain times. And then at other times, there's more of a formal where there's preaching and, and, and there's no room for a whole lot of questions or anything like that. And so... We talked about being born again. We talked about water, uh, not water baptism so much as being baptized into Christ. We were coming from as many angles as we could to explain to them how to be saved, how to be born again, how to be converted to Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, I mean, the seed of the word was being thrown out there continuously all through the day, every day that we had them, it was going at them. And so... I was happy about that, but I still just, I, I don't know. There was just still a disconnect. I mean, their children, they were asking a lot of questions. They were very interested in the stories. They loved the story of Adam and Eve and David and Goliath. And so I told them that story on another day and, and they were just asking all these questions and, and many of them were the right questions. But I still, I just, in my spirit, I just felt there was too much of a spiritual disconnect. We, we need to get these kids to connect to the Lord. And she saw the exact same thing. We were praying the, the same things, the same things together and separate. And so this is when it really came to a crescendo. I don't want to spend too much time on this presenting, but I do want you to get a sense and a feel for what happened. So I want to tell you, not just yet, but on Tuesday night, that was the last night that we had there in the Philippines. And then the next day, Wednesday was when we were going to go and get on the ferry and go back to the big city. We were leaving the island. So it had come down to the last night, very early in the morning. 
Chari like the one of God that she is. The Lord woke her up and she felt that she needed to pray. And she taps me and wakes me up and says, baby, we, we need to pray. This is it. We need to pray. And like the man of God I am, I turned over and I went back to sleep for about two or three minutes. For just about two or three minutes. Because the conviction of the whole, look, my body was tired, but that conviction was so strong. There was no sleeping. And so I got up eventually and we prayed and we sought the Lord and we interceded for those kids. And we had been praying all week, but this was different. And then so they had school Tuesday. You know, it's a school day. It's a school. Uh, so they went to school and they knew it was the last day. And we had something really special planned for them and they knew it. And she told them, you know, and so they they came earlier than they normally do. I, I don't know if you noticed that, but I noticed they showed up much earlier. This was it. And they knew this was it. But they were looking at it for, for the fun stuff that was coming. We were looking at it like, no, we got to connect these kids to God in a much more powerful, more significant way. That's what needs to happen here. And so we began to sing and worship. Uh, me and Jari began to worship the Lord. They were singing. You got to understand something about the Filipino culture. Their culture is a culture where they all love to sing. I haven't met anybody. Someone that's more stoic and reserved, introverted. Someone that's more extroverted and outgoing. I don't know that I've ever met a Filipino that doesn't love, I mean love, to sing and do karaoke. And when they do karaoke, Lord have mercy on the weekend because they are going to do it all through the night. I mean, they just go on and on. We've seen, we, we've experienced this where it goes on for hours and hours into the early morning. That's they love why, to sing. Excuse me. That's why our government, like, I don't know, two years or five years ago, uh, have a policy that we can only have karaoke till 10 p.m. only. <laughs> because we literally sing, like, until, like, morning. If we don't want to stop. But uh, there's so many complaints, so the government have a curfew 10 only. P.M. <laughs> okay, so... So I just wanted to give you that so that you can understand because, man, I'm telling you, singing is a big deal to them. And these kids on day one, they were singing. And when they sing, it's not like a lot of us around here, you know. We just, you know, the Lord can hear me, you know, the Lord can hear me. No, they are getting it out. They are projecting. They don't need microphones. You go in department stores and, and, and they're trying to showcase, you know, like a karaoke speaker and a microphone. The, the, the workers are singing on it. They're singing and they're, while you're shopping in the store, they're singing. And, and I mean, it's loud too many times. So just that's the environment. That's the culture. That's, that's how it is over there. And so now we're ready for the first video. We're worshiping, we're singing. And then this is Tuesday night. I wanted to tell you that um, the, the scripture that I read at the beginning, uh, Psalms chapter 2, and, and I, I put a little emphasis on kissing the sun, on paying homage to the sun. And so they had been singing for a while. We were singing. And, and, and when I just looked around, most of them were sitting down. I believe all of them were sitting at that point. And, and it, here we are. It's the same thing. I'm just like, God, what? What do you want me to do, you know? We got to do something, you know, we got to intervene. And so I lowered the music and I told him, I said, come on, just everybody stand up. I said, do you understand who you're singing to? You understand this is God that we're singing to, you know? And, and so I talked to them about getting serious with God. You get serious with God. God will get serious with you. And I talked to them about putting your blinders on and just really getting rid of the distractions because just like just like any of us you know talking and, and distracted with one another they were doing it you know the whole time and and so they stood up out of respect and then okay now let's play it again so so back to that same video this is what what it looked like after they've been singing a little while
Okay, so, so that's what ended up happening. They all stood up when I asked them, and then as time goes on, they slowly, some of them will start to sit down. They're just getting tired, you know. I, I get it, man. I, totally. <laughs> and so after that had been going on, I, look, I was feeling the presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm sure Charlie was too. And, but it still wasn't it. That, that wasn't it. That was, we could have stopped and just said, okay, let's just finish singing and we'll go on and, and with the rest of what we had planned. No. No, I, I knew I knew in my heart this was not it. This was not the time to stop. And so lowered, I lowered the music and I started to talk to them about how one day every knee is going to bow. I like to talk about that when I'm trying to get people to understand how important it is to connect with God. One day every knee is going to bow. And I told them, I said, look down at those knees. I'm sure the teenagers, some of you know, I've done this with you. Look at the knees. I said, touch them knees, those knees right there. One day, whether you want to or not, whether you're an atheist, an agnostic, like you're not sure if you believe in God or you just don't believe in God, whether you're of some other religion or some other faith, or I don't go to that kind of church, it doesn't matter. You're gonna stand before God. Those knees are gonna bend. They're gonna bend and you're gonna bow before him and that tongue, that mouth is gonna confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, whether you want to or not. And this is what I said, so get ready for the next video. We're not ready yet, but just get it ready. So when I said that, I raised the music up. And when I raised the music up, this happened. finished talking to him, I did not tell them to kneel. I didn't tell them to bow. When I raised the music and the song began to play, this girl right here, the tallest girl in the room, Michaela, she's 13 years old. She hit the ground. She went down. Boom. And then like dominoes. Every last one of them went down and they just started to kneel before the Lord as they sang. So I, we were shifting more toward what God was, was wanting. And so we were getting closer. But we still weren't there, but we were in the right direction. There was no question about it. And then, like, usually the kids just get up and walk out when they want to go to the bathroom. Now, now, you saw that one girl? She got up and she went to Auntie Char and she asked permission to leave. Look, it's not about control. Right, right. It's about what was going on yes. in that little kid's heart. That's it's it. about That's reverence. It. Yeah. It's about respect. It's about homage. It's about she's beginning to understand what it is to kiss wow. the son, to yeah. kiss Jesus, to really give him that respect and that reverence that belongs to him. Not because you're in my house. No, because we're worshiping, we're singing yes. to Jesus. Right now, this is his house. Right now, this is about him. It's not about that, it's about him. And so that's what ended up happening right there, okay? So when that started to happen, that got my attention. I was like, okay, Lord, all right. And so I'm praying and I'm interceding. And I know Chari was too. She was really interceding. And then we, we wanted to talk more about the name because they're singing the song. And, and, and it occurred to me, this is an English song. That's not their native language. That's not their dialect. So we need to make sure these kids understand what they're singing because if we want whatever it is God's going to do in this place, we need to get their minds fully connected yes. to what's happening yes. right here. They're in the right direction, but we got to get some more understanding. So I opened my mouth to explain what Yahweh means. I felt like I did a, a decent job. I go to the next word and I began to, I, I, I knew the word, I knew what it meant, but I blanked out just as clear as the day is long blank. And I don't believe it was an attack from the enemy. 
I believe it was Aaron, it's time for you to stop talking and it's time for Ati Char to speak to him in their language. And then this is what happened. Um, this is what happened. I'll give her the mic back because <clears throat> this is what she had talked to them about. So um, Aaron blacked out and I was like a few minutes and I was like, okay. He was trying to explain what is Rafa, Jehovah Rafa. And I'm like, because I'm, I'm here just to translate whatever, say I'm going to translate in my language so that children will understand what's the meaning. And I was like, okay, so I stand, I took over, and I said, you know what's the meaning of um, Yahweh? In our language, it means Gino or Dios. You know what's the meaning of El Shaddai? Almighty God. And you know what's the meaning of um, the other one? Rafa. God is a healer. Mm. And the rest, the others, uh, uh, what, you know, what, do you know what's the meaning of manifest? Because it's a deep word, so I have to expound, make it like uh, children will understand what's manifest. And after that, I, the rest I forgot. I studied, the, before I go there, I studied the meaning, but I completely blanked out also. <laughs> so I told them, the rest, you can Google. <laughs> Okay. 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 Because I completely jumped <laughs> out. So like, okay. So I told them that uh, in my language that if you get serious with God, He will get serious with you. And if you disrespect Him, He will not manifest. He will not reveal. And then I know some of you came just for food. I mean, literally, I was in the flesh that time. Because I know there are some children that uh, come there for uh, for food, you know, and like uh, go in and out. And then, okay, I, I told them that I told Aaron that we need to change. The food must be lost, and we will know who will stay. So I'm really in a flash there. And then I told them also, some of you are just singing without meaning it in their heart, and some are serious to know about Jesus. And I told them, do you know that Jesus know the number of hairs on your head and if you worship him like in the uh, song we sang earlier he will manifest himself now now i mean there's an urgency i told him that that right now if you just be serious and if you um seek him he will manifest yes. and if you yes. call him he will manifest as in now right now i i told him that and then, then I show him, I show them how I raised my, when I was baptized with the Holy Spirit and I spoke in tongues, and this is how I position myself. So I told the children, I raised my hand and to welcome the Holy Spirit and submission. And I explained to them, and when uh, the speaking in tongues, we, I, will, we, I will explain when we come back, but right now we will just welcome first the, the presence of God. So um, I said, it's about mindset. It's about mindset. Right now, I know there's a lot of things going on in your mind. There's a lot of distraction because that's who I am also. When I pray, and there's something on my business coming, like so many ideas, you know? I said, focus, mindset, mindset, change your focus, realign, focus on God. And I said, J don't just say, uh, say Lord, Lord, God, God, because there are so many God right now. His name is Jesus. Yes. So his name is Jesus. And I, I raise, I, they follow me. They, um, they welcome the Holy Spirit. They go like this. Their position, like opening. Remember when you come here and there is a new ch uh, ch uh, children that want to be listed in the group because I list them because I want to have like attendance. And they said, Auntie Char, someone wants to uh, join us, but they're shy and they're outside the house. And just like, where are they? Like, in the, like, by the door. So I go out and like, I welcome them. Oh, no, you come. So my hand is like this, welcoming them. And then come here first. Uh, it's just my makeup because I know they're outside and their feet are dirty and hands dirty. So at first, I'm going to show them to the bathroom. <laughs> I want them to um, wash their feet and hands first and then 
go to our room. And then that's it. Remember, that is how I welcome you. So I want you to do the same thing. I, and then remember, I keep telling you, the Lord will not force you because you have free will. Since the beginning, I told you that there is a free will. I told them that. And do you know that faith pleases God? Faith is not feeling. And I told them, it's a decision right now. And if you accept him or reject right now, it's up to you. And you know, it pleases him if you welcome them. Now, right now, he will manifest. And so they're like, I feel like, strong uh like presence of the lord so before that i saw one of the children on my right one of the child on my right she's already weeping um the song and just worshiping there and then there's another child that uh, like in between us uh she likes sandwich in between us and she already feel the presence of god but she's shy and she covered her face and she go out because she don't want to be still crying so she went out, in and out, in and out, and I'm like, really distracting to me. And I look at the other children, and I look at them, oh Lord, they're like still zombie to me, the other children, like literally like zombie. And I said, there must be something I need to be done. So I have to explain that time. And then um, I emotioned Aaron to keep playing the music that time was uh, we sang uh, King Jesus, and then again, the, and then the, the Spirit of God was heavy on, on me, and I know, um, <sighs> that is our last night, <clears throat> and I still don't see changes, and I pray to God, Lord, <laughs> touch all of them because <laughs> I don't know when they're going to come back. The last time we came, that was five years ago, we did not know we can come back <laughs> because of the COVID-19 and we came back. One of the, one of the, <laughs> the original passed away, we did not know about that and I was like, what? She died? Why? I was like, and I was like, Lord, if you don't do it now, when? I was groaning. Lord, please have mercy. And I was thinking that if it's my fault, the Lord did not did not manifest because I had I got an attitude really before prior to that uh, <coughs> so everyone I fell I went fell um the motorcycle and I have bruises and I'm in pain and my sore throat uh really irritates me I just got back I mean I literally was sick I thought I cannot travel because I got fever and I tried to suppress it and I was afraid that if there is checkpoint and because the, the term in the temperature, I will be kicked out to the plane. So, and my throat was really sore that day and coughing so hard. And I was telling Aaron the goal, what is the itinerary? And I told him uh, the details of this is, uh, we have only one way, okay? And I uh, want, my goal is baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to explain and the, the Sunday we need to gather children and uh, we cannot have like a fellowship in the in the morning and then you cannot continue about the baptism or continue whatever you want to say. And it cannot lead to baptism. And um, um, Aaron he said okay. Uh, he understood uh, the itinerary after that I asked him Okay, so what is our itinerary again? I said, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I was like, I already got an attitude. Okay, please get your um, like notepad and write down, because I don't want to keep repeating myself, because my throat is really hurting right now. And you ask me, what is the itinerary for the day? 
And I was just like, I, there's something going on, then I burn myself cooking, and like, there's cause so many going on, and there's so many calls, like, you know, like, the delivery is here, like, oh, like, it's too much for me, you know? And then right there, so I, I asked the Lord, forgive me, Lord, if this is the reason that you did not show up because of my attitude, please forgive me. Cover me with your, with your blood, Lord Jesus. You are my righteousness. But please spare the children, Lord. It's an intercessor position. And so she, she broke it down to these kids and explained the urgency. And then so I, wanted, I just want to have one little thing before we go to that video. Right when she finished saying whatever it is that she was saying, because I couldn't understand a word of what she was saying. She just begins to groan out and weep out loud. I mean, it was loud. And then she hits the ground and then you can go ahead, sweetie, with the next video. Jesus, praise you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. kids do that. You, you can't do that. That's, that's not even possible. And so there was only one dry eye in the room and it was this girl that's right in the middle. I don't know if you noticed in the video, but she's kind of in the middle and you see she's like comforting and, and, and she's kind of smiling and, and she's feeling good. She's feeling the presence of the Lord. That's the way the Lord touched her. And when she gave her testimony, she said that she felt joy. She just felt joy. But when the Holy Spirit came down, it was like a wave. The way she described it, Chari started to groan and moan in the spirit. And there was these two other girls that began to cry. And then like a wave, it just flowed all through the room. They all just started to weep. 
and mourn, just like what you saw there. And then I've seen this before, but I haven't been like right there, right in the middle of it where something like this happens. And I have to be honest, it shocked me. I was like, God, what do you want me to do? You're doing it all. I mean, so I just started to pray and then I went and started to lay hands on a couple of those kids and just, I just prayed. I, I don't know. Sometimes I think we just need to get out of the way. I think we just need to step aside and let, let the man, Jesus Christ, let him do what he does. Right. And so out of all the words that I spoke the whole week, everything that I was trying to convey in one moment, when that wave of the Holy Spirit just came through the room, that is what it is. That's what it's all about. That was what it was all about. And I'm thankful that, that Chari was obedient because I think if I wouldn't have just stopped talking and, and I mean, God got me to stop talking, right? My mind blanked out. So <laughs> thank God. <laughs> so I'm going to take that as a lesson to be more sensitive to listen to what the Lord's telling me, okay? And then, so if you would, we're ready for that first uh, photo. And this is Isa May. And then we're going to go to some of the testimonies. And so if you would, can you make the face bigger and maybe bring it down where they can see her good? And then you can go ahead with the first. This You have to look at the screen. There's subtitles, okay? Because Chari is interviewing them and asking them to share what happened. We're only going to just show a few. Okay, that's eyes of May. And eyes of May was a very quiet girl. She had that more introverted personality. She was very, very smiley. I mean, honestly, they're all very smiley, but um, she had just a real tender, sweet spirit about it. And there's a theme that kind of goes on with her testimony and the next two testimonies. There's a lot of loss that some of these kids collectively have experienced. Loss in their families and the grieving process, which I reshared about their culture is a very serious, real thing. And I'm sure Maricel back there can fully understand is that there, there's not a whole lot of emotion that really flows forth when, with, with the it's hard to explain. It's, it really is difficult. But when it comes to the, uh, the crying and the tears and the, the, the letting the guard down, that kind of emotion, um, th there's not always a whole lot of that. And so I believe that what happened is this girl was crying and the Lord was dealing with her heart and helping her to grieve, continue to grieve for her grandmother. It meant a lot to that kid. Okay, so if you would, could you put number two up there, Princess. This is Princess Hart. This is Jenilyn, the one I was telling you about. This is her younger daughter, uh, sister, not daughter. And she can sing really well, just like her sister. And she wouldn't sing where we could really hear. Okay, so Princess Hart was uh, thinking about her sister, 
and she was thinking about the loss there. And so it was a similar situation going on with her. Now, I know that as you read the subtitles, you'll see there's manifestations that they're talking about. We don't preach and we don't teach manifestations. We don't teach that you need to shake. We don't teach, you know, any of all that other stuff that to me is insignificant. I want to know about the content, what's going on inside. I want to know what's going on in their soul and their spirit. I want to know what's on their mind. And that's the reason we did this because we wanted to capture. Uh, and honestly, if we showed every one of them, it was more on the manifestation. So we, we grabbed the ones that had, had more sentimental value, the ones that were a little more mature, a little bit older, and had a better understanding and, and was really hearing what the Lord was speaking to them and showing them. So the net, before you do the video, we're going to put Leanne up there. That's number three. Leanne Rose. Okay? All right. <laughs> Okay, so Leanne Rose, her story was a little different, and yes, she did say she was convulsing. The word that they use in, in Basai is our Sabuano Basai is, is a very strong word for shaking. And she was out, no one asked her to share that, that story out there like with the group. But after we left the room and everyone went out, she was telling everybody what happened and they were laughing at her. And he said, oh yeah, like you're an epileptic, you know, having a seizure, you were convulsing. And she got so mad. She's like, that is what happened. I was, sh you know, she was just sharing her experience. And so what ended up happening was later we came back together as a group in the room and it came up again. We were watching, uh, we were watching this actually on the screen after it was recorded and they were just, because the reason we did it individually, you know how kids can do, they yeah. can kind of copy each other and piggyback off of each other's stories. Yeah. So that's the reason we did it one-on-one. -on -one. But once it was all done, it was like, that's cool. We'll just bring it all together. And so everybody was watching each of the videos. And when they got to hers, they did it again. They started laughing at her and she got so furious. This girl, Leanne Rose, stood up and started to leave the room. And Chari stood up and went and grabbed her and brought her back in. And publicly in front of everybody, Chari said, I am so proud of you. That is awesome because when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit and I began to speak in tongues, I began to shake very, very rapidly yeah. in a similar way. So you had a really similar experience than I did. Yeah. And all the kids hushed. Yeah. Yeah. And then this kid was like, <laughs> all right. That's all right. Auntie Char and I got another thing in common. I had a high five with her to yeah, encourage her. That's she right. Really walk out like her. Go to the next one. Number four, Michaela. Okay, Michaela was the one. She's the one who first hit the ground, her knees. You know, when, when, when they began to kneel and bow down, she was the very first one to go down and lead the way on that. And so, you can go ahead. <laughs> So as these testimonies are going, we're, we try to put the more mature ones, you know, the ones where I think that sometimes these kids are so young and they're so undeveloped in, in spiritual things that they don't even know how to express what's going right, on. Right. But this one did a really good job expressing it. And that was a theme message throughout what was being preached and taught. And, and I had hit on it early that same night. And then Chari hit on it really hard 
just before the Holy Spirit moved in the way that he did. So it really, really got a hold of her heart. It, it, we're just so thankful for that. And then the last one of, of these videos, number five, is Twin Ishan. <laughs> She she likes to be called twin Ishan because when she was born, she was born a twin, and her twin sister passed away. So we refer to her as twin Ishan. She's 14 years old. She's the oldest out of the, all those kids. These kids don't read the Bible. They, she, her mind was renewed. Yeah. This girl doesn't read the Bible. She doesn't have access to a Bible. It's nothing but pure, deep, overhanging, useless religion over there. They don't get the truth. They don't get the gospel in that fashion, in that form. And this kid, I mean, the way she articulated what the Lord was doing in her heart and in her mind was like, I was like, what? Are you serious? This girl, you go to her Facebook page and look at her post from the moment this happened. Her, the, the whole thing is completely changed. The whole, everything. It's all Christian music, worship music. It's all Christian content. This kid has been transformed. I know, I, I am fully convinced that she had a true born again encounter with Christ. There's no question in my mind. I can't say that about all the others as far as, you know, what you might see. But what I'm saying is the sanctification process has already begun. That very night, it had already begun. The renewing of the mind, the changing of the way that she thinks. I'm telling you, that girl right there, no doubt, has a call in her life. And there is something super special about what God's going to do with her. And when she, when we first went to the Philippines 10 years ago, she was just a little kid. I believe she was like four years old. She would have been four years old because she's 14 now. Yeah, so... And she was just holding tight to her mom and Chari. You know how she is with kids. Chari's got to get win you over. And so she's trying to win her over. And she was just clenching to her mom. And then when she came this time as a 14-year-old on this trip, she was still very reserved and very shut down. And I believe she was just wanting to see what is this really all about? What is going on here? Like, is this, is this something that I need? Is this something really for me? You know? And... and <laughs> You were going to have to persuade her, but I didn't have to, and Chari didn't have to. The Lord did. The Lord did. And so, uh, the next photo, Josh Noah. This guy right here, the enemy really attacked him after the Lord had just really, really started to get a hold of him. The Word of God became a huge deal to this kid. I had a Tagalog Bible. That's their national language. I had a Gideon Tagalog Bible had picked up at an estate sale for real cheap and I've been bringing it with me offshore because there's Filipinos <coughs> offshore that I work with and I never really was able to give it to somebody that was wanting it. And so we brought it on the trip and he got a hold of it and he went into a corner in the room while the other kids are drawing and writing stuff. And, and he started to read it out loud. And he was enamored by the word of God. He told, he went to Chari and he said, Ati Char, he said, I, I, I just can't stop reading it. Like the Bible is so good. He said, I just can't stop reading. He was reading in Genesis. And this was what he said. I, it's so good. The more I read, the more I love it. I want to read more. And then what ended up happening was, I'll be honest with you. 
the itinerary she had and the itinerary, which I didn't really have an itinerary, but <laughs> what, what I had envisioned in mind was not water baptism because these are young children. They're steeped with vain, useless religion. Their parents, uh, you know, they're under the uh, authority of their parents and, and we're not just going to take kids out there and water baptize them. That's not right. And so I know this was something that was in Chiree's heart. And so I said, look, you know, when y'all go home, just let your parents know we're going to the beach tomorrow. We're going to go swimming. If you want to be baptized, ask your parents if you can be baptized. So none of them were given permission to be baptized. But this kid got water baptized because his parents abandoned him. And he was so, so about the word of God. And he was so wanting to know more about being born again and the born again faith. And he said, God, I didn't realize it was so simple. Like he's, we were out in the water talking about it. He said, I didn't realize it was so simple. I thought it was so complicated, you know, like. And he's like, are y'all seven-day Adventists? And there was some confusion stirring among the group. Like, oh, yeah, I think they're seven-day Adventists. And so we cleared that up real quick. And uh, <laughs> we didn't want to be mistaken about that. And so while we're out in the water, he, he started to make a confession. And in the car, he made a confession of Christ. And, and I said, well, what about your parents? Did you talk to your parents? He said, I don't have parents. My parents have left me. I said, well, who do you stay with? He said, I stay with my aunt and my uncle. I stay with relatives. I said, well, what about them? He said, I want to be baptized. <laughs> and so I said, okay, let's do this. We're going to water baptize this guy right here in the water. And so we went down in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. We water baptized him. And he came up out of that water. He was like, wow, like this is, I just didn't realize it was this simple. I thought it was complicated. Yeah. And that vain religion they call it, that's complicated. You want to talk about what doesn't make sense. Yeah. So what ended up happening is we got down to the second last day. It was Monday. And then the enemy attacked him and he, he started running a fever. And he showed up. He showed up anyway. But then Tuesday, it was still going on. It was running its course. He didn't show up. We were going to give him that Bible on Tuesday. So we left the Bible uh, with her mom and her brother who stays at our house. And to give to him. And so it just didn't happen quite like we wanted to with that. But but we know God's got it. God's got it. So if you go to the next one, number seven, Leah Jean. Leah Jean is one of the original. She was the oldest out of the original kids. Okay, so Leah Jean had left Komodi's Island and went to Cebu City to get a job and work in a restaurant over there so she could send money back and help her family because her dad is an alcoholic and he's not reliable for money and the family flowing into the man into the family because whenever he would go to work he would just go and spend the money to get something to drink so it was a huge it's a huge struggle uh, on that island with alcoholism with uh, most of the males that are not serving the lord and so we went and we found her uh, her sister gave us uh, an address and we went to the address and the name was different they had changed the name of the restaurant but it still was the same place so as we're approaching the building, we're walking up, Chari goes on in to the building and I'm lagging behind her. And I look over to the side, I see there's a vehicle park and they're taking groceries out of the vehicle for the restaurant. And she was right there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> this girl has such a sweet spirit about her. She always did, ever since the day, the day we met her when she was 10 years old. And when she saw me in her eyes and that, she just took off running and, uh, and, and gave me a big hug. And so as a result of all that, you know, we ate at the restaurant and then we, we asked, you know, if it was possible, she thought she could come with us to go to go into town that evening. We wanted to, you know, just treat her and do something nice for her. And uh, so Chari went to, <laughs> she went to the uh, supervisor uh, that was at the counter and asked her, she said, hey, you know, uh, I want to, uh, we, we want to know if she can take off, you know, who's the supervisor, who's the manager. And she said, well, I'm not the manager, but I can speak on her behalf. You know, things are usually slow in the afternoon. So it worked out where we could go get her and, and we took her, we took her shopping, got her a bunch of things that she needed. We were able to bless her. It was just really awesome to be able to bless her and do that. And then at the end of the day, um, we brought her up to our room at the hotel and we laid hands on her. And we really prayed for this girl and she just broke and just really just uh, a, a spirit of contrition and brokenness, you know, and, and started to talk to her about hooking up in a church over there that, that we found that we knew that would be good. And, uh, 
so she agreed and she to do it but then later on after after we were already on our flight and flying home she uh, kind of reneged on said, I think I need to talk to my mom first. There's just a really strong spirit of bondage to that religion over there. And she knew that her mom might have a problem with it. So I told her, I said, look, it's good to honor your mother and your father. I said, you're 20 years old though, you're an adult. So you do need to honor her. And that's fine if you want to let her know what you're wanting to do. And so I ended up, sending her the scripture, I said, did you know that Jesus had some really strong things to say? Jesus had some really strong things about mothers and fathers and family. In Matthew 10, 34 through 39, he says, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be members, the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. And this is what she told me. She said, and this is a question, not a statement. She was asking it means I love my mom more than Jesus. And she put a really sad face. I said, no, I think you're showing respect to your mother. We will always have to honor our parents, but we must, we must obey Jesus before anyone else. Yes, hallelujah. Before anyone else. He must be first. There can only be one Number one, yes, yes. there can only be one yes. who occupies that spot. Amen. It means that we should rather please Jesus than anyone else. Amen. He will judge us. And this can be a way for you to show your mother what a true commitment to Jesus yes. looks like. Yes. So she said, now I understand. And we continue to have some more conversation. And uh, we let it just lay and just we want to see what the Lord's going to do. And then Chari just recently reached out to her again and um, to follow up because what she did was she, she said that Sabuano Bible that I gave you go look up that scripture in the language and read it you need to understand it and so that was the end of it and so then Chari just finally went and made another this has been since we got back so this has been what two I guess now it's been close to two weeks since we got back and then had this conversation so then Chari followed up with it just to see you know what's going on what are you thinking what's in your head what's in your mind you know She's got to make that decision. I realize that she's 20 years old, but she's, she's going to make that decision after she has some good counsel. <laughs> All right. So because she just doesn't know a whole lot, we haven't had a whole lot of time to spend with her. So if you would, if you would go to the number eight large group, it's a large group photo. It's a photo of this is the most kids that we've had show up on any given night. It was about 28 kids, it was about 28. So they started to learn that they, we were doing a dance thing with the kids. And, and it was a dance to a song called Send the Fire. It was written by William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. And it's talking about the fire of the Holy Spirit coming down and how it, God, the Holy Spirit, through, through Jesus' sacrifice, changes us and, 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 and does a deep work in us. And so she taught them moves 10 years ago or nine years ago. And then she brought it back and started to teach these kids. So then all of a sudden, all these new kids show up for food and, and a fun time, you know? They love to sing and dance, they love it. So then if you go to the next one, if you go to the next photo, that's gonna be where we're all wearing those t-shirts. That's Chari's uh, put that together and those who were in the dance and committed to learning it and, and were committed to coming and hearing the word of God and, and everything else, they were given a shirt. So, and that's just the big group picture of that and then um, there was a big uh, group photo the next one is uh, number 10 Sandy is going to be that next one yeah that's the uh, the just a big group photo of all the kids that were there when the Holy Spirit fell the way he did which is very very sentimental to us and uh, so then uh, the last thing was uh, Chari. Chari had this idea she's done it before in the Philippines where 
we'll go buy a birthday cake and we'll just get all the kids and we'll celebrate all of their birthdays <laughs> at one time. <laughs> and so this means the world to these kids. They love it. They love it. So um, if you would, you can go ahead and this is uh, the farewell birthday video. you to get the essence yes. of what happened over there when the Holy Spirit falls like that I mean what do you do I'm just like I I honestly have never been put in that kind of position and I had no clue no idea that was going to happen but the very first uh, the scripture that I read in the beginning kiss the sun kiss the sun the title of my five minute message is what are you kissing him for what are you kissing him for? That's, that's assuming that you're kissing him. That's assuming that you're giving him some form of homage. That's a, assuming that you're giving him some form of reverence and respect. Or maybe it's not really that, it's just attention. So after reading that passage of scripture, there was a particular part in Psalms chapter 2 where it talks about, it says, you are my son today, I have begotten you. And so that is one of the first songs that most Bible scholars can prove and feel confident that David is the one. King David wrote that song. OK, and, and there's not as much evidence for it until you go into Scripture and then you see where uh, the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts in chapter 13, he actually quotes it and he pulls a piece from it. And that's what he's actually quoting, where he says, you are my son today. I have begotten you. And Paul shows a distinction between King David and King Jesus. And the distinction is this, is that King Jesus, when he died, his body, it did not decay. And when he rose from the dead and when he ascended, into, there was never a decaying of any body with Jesus. But when David, Paul makes it very clear, when King David died, his body did decay. And so Chapter 2 of Psalms is a very prophetic psalm, and it does have some application, in my opinion, to David. And I believe it's got a real heavy application to Jesus. Yes. And then there's application to the kings of the earth that were around at David's time, the kings of the earth that are around now. Yes. And then the kings of the earth that will be around in the future when Jesus returns, that they're going to surround the armies of the Lord, and they're going to think, they're going to think that they can destroy God and his army. And God looks down and he laughs and he scoffs at them. He looks at them in derision like, what are you thinking? This is so pathetic. 
It's silly to think, but why are these heathens? Why are they so angry at God? That's another message and another story for another time. This is the first confirmation, Acts 13, 33. It confirms that he's talking about Jesus. In Hebrews 1, 5 through 8, he confirms it again and he quotes it again. The, the author of Hebrews says, you are my son today, I have begotten you. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Angels worship him. This son, remember he said, you are my son today. I have begotten you. So this son, he's calling him God because the angels worshiped him. And then it goes on later in that same passage and it calls Jesus God. Yes. And so we know that Jesus is God. And I know there's other religions out there that don't believe that Jesus is God. They might believe he's a God or they don't believe he's a God at all. But what I want to tell you is that there's so much in Scripture to validate that Jesus is not just a man, but he's God. And when you look at Hebrews 10, 5, he says, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Yes. See, Jesus was not created. He was pre-existing that body that yes. was prepared for Amen. him. God, the father prepared a body for Jesus Christ. He is the eternal one. We know he's the Alpha and Omega. We know what that means. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. When the last person laughs on earth, he'll still be where he is. And Jesus Christ had a body prepared for him. He was not created in his spirit. He was not created a soul. There was nothing like no creation there. He always was. He always existed. But a body was created, yes. prepared for him. And in Hebrews 5.5 5 gives us a third confirmation. And he says it there again. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And it goes on and it explains. This is talking about Jesus Christ. So this prophetic chapter, Psalms chapter 2, is making it very clear. This is Jesus Christ. This is, this is the son that he wants to be kissed. He's not really talking about King David. And he's talking about homage. And he is talking about reverence. He is talking about that. And then there's a fourth confirmation. And I think there's even more. But this is a five minute message. So Revelation 2, 26 through 27. Jesus quotes verse 9 of Psalms chapter 2. He says, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end. To him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. And that's a direct quote from verse 9. Verse 9. Or uh, I believe it's verse 7. And then there's a part that's from verse 9 of Psalms 2. And he says, as I also have received authority from my father. So he's talking about the authority that was given to Jesus. And then in this passage in Revelation, he's now including that church there. I believe it's Philadelphia, if I remember correctly. And he's telling them, you'll participate with me. You'll, you'll be a part of that, that authority and that ruling. And so what are you kissing him for? If you are kissing him, if you are giving him reverence, what are you kissing him for? What are you giving him reverence for? Or are you really giving him reverence? That, that could be a bigger, better question to ask. And so I just wanted to quickly read uh, Matthew chapter 26, verses uh, 47 through 50 is the story of Judas. And it says, while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the 12, came up accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and elders of the people. He didn't come from the rest of the disciples. He came from, he was with the chief priests. He was with the wrong group of people. Now, he who was betraying him gave them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, sees him. And then I'm just going to read a little further. Well, yeah, I'm going to 50. Immediately, Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And so I have to, that's, that's, that's the, what we're doing is we're looking at the extremist of, the most extreme kisses in the Bible. That's one. That's one of the most extreme kisses in the Bible. Now I want to go to the other side. 
Luke 7, 36. The other side of that spectrum, looking at an extreme reverence, an extreme expression through kissing. And so Luke 7, 36. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair on her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee had, who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him. He wasn't talking to Jesus, friend. He was thinking to himself. It, said, it says, and Jesus answered him. Isn't that interesting? Simon, I have something to say to you. So his name is Simon. And he replied, say it, teacher. And then he goes on. Jesus says, a money, lend a money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, who have you have judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she since the time I came in has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It was a custom in the Jewish culture in Israel. That when you invite someone to your house, you would wash their feet. Not that it didn't have to be you personally, but you would have a servant. You would have somebody who would wash their feet. You invited them. They were your guests in the home. And it was respect. That's what that was. And then you would also take oil in many cases, and you would anoint their head with oil. Respect. Reverence. This didn't happen. This never did happen with Simon the Pharisee. There was opposition and there was resistance. There was opposition and resistance toward her. She was not invited, but she was there. She had heard about this. She heard that Jesus was gonna be there. And when she heard that Jesus was gonna be there, she just showed up. She made her way over to the house and inside the house. Somehow, I don't know if she walked in, she ran in, or she crawled in, she got in because she was determined to get to Jesus. And when she got to Jesus, regardless of the fact that she wasn't invited, she had already been understood and she had already been known. The community knew her as a sinner. And a sinner was someone immoral, someone that had been doing things that was looked down upon in a much more grave manner than other sins. You know, lying and stealing is bad. But then there's other things that, you know, you just look at it different. And so she was, and this is Luke, right? I mean, this is Luke saying this. She was a sinner. But then when she's referred to by Simon the Pharisee, he's thinking in his heart, if he knew what a sinner this sinner is, if he knew just how much of a sinner this sinner was, because in his heart, he was being prideful and he was thinking, yeah, maybe I do have sin, but I'm not as sinful as she is. Mm -hmm. I like the way Kenneth Weiss says it in his translation, his New Testament translation. He's a Baptist Bible scholar of the past, a, a Greek Bible scholar. 
And he said in verse 38, the way he translates it, he says, with her tears falling like rain, she began to be wetting his feet. And so Jesus had come into that house. They were either dusty or they were just muddy or whatever. I'm thinking maybe dusty. And with her tears, when she went to Jesus' feet, they were just falling like rain and she had enough tears to get the job done. She didn't need Simon to bring water. She had her own water. She brought her own water and it was through contrition. It was through brokenness. And what the tears represent is they represent the confession of her sin. They represent the brokenness over her sin that she knew that she was guilty. And she had taken that to the right place, to the place of remedy. She had taken it to a place where it could be made right. Yes. And with the fragrant ointment, after she had been washing his feet, wetting his feet with the tears that were watering out and falling like rain, she took ointment and then she began to anoint and, and, and apply that fragrant. It was a, it was a sweet smelling ointment. And, and I believe that represents the gratefulness because the, the tears, you know, that's I've done wrong. I need forgiveness. But now I want to give you something from me to you. This is what Praise I'm doing God. for you. Yeah, I want to anoint your feet with this. And I want you to know how grateful I am yes. that you have forgiven me, that you have made it right yes. what I have done wrong for how many years. And in the parable, he tells them, he's speaking of debt. He's comparing sin to debt. That's what he did there. Did you catch that when we ran through it? He's making a comparison in this parable. It's just a two verse parable. And he's comparing it to debt. We are indebted to Christ. And this man didn't realize it. She knew it. She knew that she was. And I love what he asks and what he says. Well, first he asks the question of Simon. And he asks him, who, who was forgiven the most? Who's the one who was forgiven the most? And he said, I would assume, I would assume it, was, it was the one that had the greater debt. And it's true. And the sad thing is, I wonder if he really was capturing what Jesus was trying to tell him. He was saying, this woman has the most debt in sin. And she has the most to be forgiven. And so she has the most gratefulness. And she has the most love to be poured out on me. And here I came to your house and you didn't bring any water to wash my feet. There was no oil for my head. You invited me. I didn't ask to come over here. I don't turn anyone away that welcomes me and invites me to come. And I came and you didn't. And so this woman stepped in and she took the place, the rightful place. And she anointed his feet. And the advantage of washing and kissing Jesus' feet, he responds to it. He responds to it. When you kiss the son, you don't have to worry about his anger being kindled against you. You don't have to worry about that. And this is the thing that really stood out to me. It kind of came to me late this morning, actually, before I got here. Is that she never stopped. He says she just kept, she never ceased to be kissing my feet. She never ceased to be washing my feet. And it speaks of sanctification. It speaks of us going to the cross yes. one time. Yes. And then we continue to be crucified at that cross continually. We never cease to go to the cross. We never cease to be crucified. And this is the thing. It doesn't matter if you were filled with the Holy Spirit years ago. It doesn't matter if you were born again years ago. If now, where are you? Now, what is the condition and the state of your heart? He wants you to continually, he wants us to continually go to him. He wants us to continually apply those tears to his feet, to kiss his feet in reverence and in respect. That's what he requires. That's what he desires. Why so distant if we're born again? Why are we so distant at times? Are we growing in God? Are we still going to the cross? Are we still seeking his face? Are we doing that? This would happen with these kids over there. I would love to see that happen to this whole church. Yes. I would love to see it happen to our teenagers, to our children, to our adults. I would like to see something like that happen. That would be great. Whatever the Lord wants, that's what I want. Yes. But I can tell you this. Those kids were so distracted the whole week until this moment when they finally had those blinders on and they finally gave God 
the due attention and reverence that, that belonged to him. And when they did it, you saw what just happened there. You saw what happened. I mean, there's no explaining. I could try to explain it, but it's just better to show you. I'm glad I captured it on video. Yes. Yes. You might have thought I was exaggerating. I mean, really, because I was telling people they were mourning. They were weeping. The whole room, except for one kid. Weeping. Mourning. Like they had just lost a loved one. And that's what many of them were weeping over in their testimony. They said, I lost my grandmother. I lost my sister. I lost a family member. And that's what they were doing. And the Lord was healing them. He was healing their hearts. These kids don't have exposure to the presence of God like that anywhere else. But now they do. Now they do. And so we got to stay connected with these kids. Yes, yes. We've got to stay connected. And we are. We, we just connected with two of them yesterday. Mm. And uh, it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a strain. And I'm going to tell you the biggest thing that we need is to understand is that what Jesus told her in that last verse, that no, verse number 50, that is the most important thing. He didn't say your love has saved you. He didn't say your loyalty has saved you. He didn't say any of that. That's not what he said. He said, your faith has saved you. And it was because of her faith that she had great love for God. It, she had a lot of love for the sin and the lifestyle. And that's why she had a great debt of sin to be forgiven. He who loves much needs to be forgiven much. And so because of her faith, the love, the affection, the object of affection changed. And so we have to come to God, not looking for what we can get from God. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I'll be honest with you. Okay. We all know that that's, that's, that's how the plan works. But if, if it's all about me not going to hell and it's all about me going to heaven, then what just happened there? Where's God in that? Where, when does it get to be about him? Come on. When does it get to be about him? Because the thing is, well, there's been a lot of talk about this, this message of the past that was preached by a parish readhead, and I'm thankful that John had gotten a hold of it and kind of brought it back to the surface around here. If you haven't watched that message, you should find it. What is it? Ten shekels and a shirt. And in that message, he's talking about the focus of the people, the, the, the Christian church or you know, in America and in other places and how the focus has just got completely away from what it's supposed to be. Yeah. It's supposed to be about God yeah. and it's supposed to be centered around him getting his glory and getting what is due to him. See, I don't come to God so I, I can be saved and not have to go to hell because that's a real bad, bad hell. I don't want to go to bad hell. I want to go to good heaven. Mm. It's not about that. It's about me coming to him so that he can get me as the soul. As a reward. What, this is what he said. Worthy is the lamb to receive the reward yes. of his suffering. Yes. That's what it's about. It's not about me not going to hell. Because I deserve it. And I don't want to go. It's about him getting the reward of me. Worshiping him. And living for him. And it doesn't matter what. You did two or three years ago. Where are you today? Yes. It's what our relationship is now. We need to connect with him now. There is an urgency like never before to do this now. Yes. There needs yes. to be reverence in the house of the Lord. There needs to be reverence when we read the word of God, when we pray. There needs to be respect. There needs to be reverence. And look, that is the kind of thing that happens when yes. undivided yes. attention from everybody comes. That's what happens. The spirit of the living God gets poured out. And God gets the glory. And people are changed. Yeah. And everything that I was preaching and teaching and Chari was teaching them, everything, as good as it was, and I think it was really good, it didn't do not even a fraction of what was done in just a moment. Yes. Boom! Yes. The Holy Spirit came down. Yes. The Lord touched them. And then now you saw that last testimony. This girl's talking about how she realized that she needed forgiveness of sins. And then it wasn't no longer just about her. She took it and started praying for, for the world. And she started to pray for everybody to be saved. And everybody to have forgiveness of their sins. That's what happened. I thought I said some of that early on in the week, but I know I'm not the one that got it in her spirit. It was the Lord. It was the Lord. It was the Lord got that down in her spirit. It was Jesus got a hold of that girl. And I'm telling you, adults and teenagers alike, everybody. When we're over there in that building over there, 
If you'll just do that and stop being distracted, stop being distracted by phones and stop being distracted by talking to somebody next to you and stop allowing this because there is an audience of one there and he's delivering his word and he wants to get his worship and he wants to get his glory because he is worthy of the reward to get your soul. It's not just so you can go to heaven. He wants you to go to heaven. Look, he, was, he already told us in his word that he never prepared hell for us. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't, it wasn't created for, for us. But he's not going to change his nature. He's holy. That's it. He's holy. Yes, he, is. he has an expectation. And his expectation is he wants to be worshipped. Singers and musicians, please. You can stand up, please, if you don't mind. It wasn't a five-minute message. It was still a short message. Thank you, Jesus. You know, 30 pieces of silver, it was a significant amount of money. When Judas kissed Jesus and betrayed him like he did, it was a very significant amount of money, but it really wasn't like this enormous amount of money. You understand what I mean when I say it like that? Like, it, it was significant. He could have brought property because that's what happened, right? Some of y'all know the story. They ended up taking that money because Judas returned it. He didn't want it. He started to feel regret and remorse. Yeah. And he realized that what he'd done what was he was not getting the gratification that he wanted from the money. He was already stealing from the treasury of, of the disciples. And maybe he was getting some gratification there. But he was pushing for the big one. And I don't know if maybe the 30 pieces of silver was the big one. And when he finally got it, do you see how the story played out? He never got any real gratification from it. He felt remorse. And then when it happened, he saw it was when he saw Jesus was condemned. When he saw, he saw Jesus was condemned. He felt remorse. And he felt regret. And you don't see anywhere where there's any weeping. You don't see anywhere where there's any contrition, any brokenness of heart. He was not really sorry for his sin. He was just sorry that, I don't know what, it's turning out this way. I'm sorry that Jesus had to really get crucified. I mean, he's the son of God. He sh I thought he might be able to save himself or something. I just wanted to get this money. Or I don't know what it was. All I know is that kiss was not the right kiss. So what are you kissing him for? What are you kissing him for? I'm going to be talking about this trip to the Philippines for a while. I'm going to be trying to get some teenagers to better understand how things could be if, if, if we would just get the blinders on and just block the distractions out. If we would just really tune in to God, what can really happen? How God wants to get, if you'll get a hold of God so that in return, he'll get a hold of you. There's no telling what will happen. There's sons and there's daughters that need to be saved. There's brothers and sisters. There's mothers and fathers that still need to be saved. They need to come to Jesus. And, and the power of this presence, we got to go back and get a hold of the parents. You want to know what you can do to help? You want to help? Pray. I need you to pray. Give me your phone number and I'll send you a list of prayer requests. That's what we need. If you want to help, say, hey, you got my number? Send me that list. You don't have my, here's my number. I'll send you the list. I want you to see the names of these kids. I want you to call out their names before heaven every day or just whenever you can. Call their names out because we're going back. And when we go back, we're going after their parents. In the spirit. In the spirit. We want God to get a hold of their parents. Because we couldn't get them to go to church after we left because of the parents. I don't guess the parents really knew what we were doing. They were coming over to our house and we were having church. Let's just sing and worship the Lord just for a few minutes. It's not that late. And if you need the altar or you need prayer or you need anything, you know you can come on up here. Look, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never been born again, the Bible tells us there's a story between a man, a religious man, very religious. He was one of the most religious men in Israel. His name is Nicodemus. And Jesus told this man, you cannot 
see or you can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. You have to be born a second time. And he couldn't understand it. He was trying to understand how can you be born a second time. And Jesus broke it down and he explained to him about the Holy Spirit and the wind and how you can't see it, but it's real. It's very active. Even though you don't see it, the wind is very real. And the Holy Spirit, God wants to come into your life, but you have to believe that Jesus Christ is God. You have to believe. You can't just believe intellectually. You have to truly embrace Jesus and the fact that Jesus is God and that he left heaven and he came down to earth and he died on that cross as a ransom, as a debt payment for your sin. Whether you've loved much and you've sinned much, or whether you maybe you're not as sinful as what you think maybe other people are, whatever you've got going on, you have sinned. If you haven't brought it to the cross of Jesus Christ, you need to bring it to him. And so I want to encourage you to embrace Him and call out on the name of Jesus. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10 that whosoever calls out on the name of the Lord, he will be saved. With the mouth confession is made and with the heart a man believes. I just don't believe in repeating a prayer anymore. I just don't. I used to, but I don't anymore. I don't believe it. I haven't believed it for a long time. And people on my job offshore are getting saved without repeating a prayer. No, you just need to believe and you need to confess it. You need to put your faith in Jesus Christ and you need to know that He is the answer for your problem, for man's problem, the remedy for sin. That's what you need to do. And, and you need to embrace it. Embrace it. All right, thank you.